right, good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. You ready? Terry, we're so glad you're back. Welcome back, Terry. Terry's been out. Praise the Lord. The Lord's good to get you here, isn't he? Amen. 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 Well, what a great time of worship we had last night, and praise the Lord. We're going to do it again sometime soon, and um, but we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord this morning. How's that sound? Amen. Sound good? Yes. Well, let, let's stand up for a little bit and greet one another, say hello, and we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord.
Lord Jesus, and we worship you, we magnify, and we glorify the mighty name of Jesus, and we give you our all, we bring our best to you this morning, the King of glory, and we worship and we magnify you, Jesus, hallelujah, glory to your name, Lord, thank you, Jesus, oh, we love you, Lord, tell the Lord that you love him this morning, yes, Jesus. Yeah. 
proclamation of faith to be baptized and Lord I just pray that you would be with us through the remainder of the service Lord God and have your way and we praise you and worship you and with that everybody said amen. amen and amen well please greet one another before you're seated
Good morning. Praise the Lord. Can everybody say praise the Lord? Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Can everybody say I'm excited about Jesus? I'm excited, I'm excited about Jesus. Jesus. Amen. I'm excited about Jesus. You need a mic. They can't hear you on Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, Facebook. My name is Pastor Lynn Diekman, and no, I'm not going seeker sensitive or emergent. I'm not getting a Johnny Bravo haircut. I don't have hair for it right now, anyway, so uh, I'm good to go here. But uh, welcome, everybody, and we're glad you're here. And uh, this morning we want to start out with baptism. Baptism is vitally important, I believe, to our walk with the Lord. Uh, it does not save us. Amen. I want people to understand that. Baptism has nothing to do with our salvation in saving our soul. But it's in a thing that the Lord asks us to do, to represent as a symbol of what he did by coming to earth, dying, being buried, and he rose again alive. Yeah. into a new life so the old man goes under mm -hmm. and dies and when they come back up they represent Jesus coming back from the grave they come up in a new life a new life in Christ the old life is gone it's past mm -hmm. it's gone Jesus forgot it the sin everything when that person came to Christ and gave their life to him doesn't mean they'll never ever sin again, but when they do, now they can go to the Lord and say, God, help me never to do that again. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit living within them will give them that ability. So Jaden is going to get baptized this morning, and uh, we're excited for Jaden. Uh, Rick, where are you? You want to come up here, please? And Jaden, um, Rick, you want to just stand right here? And I'll tell you what, Jay, why don't you put your towel over there so it's nice and dry when you go downstairs, and I'm going to lay one of these here for you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I am going to take my shoes off. <laughs> and, 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 and yes, my feet are beautiful. That's for sure. <laughs> beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news, amen? Horns and all. Okay, you may go in. Praise the Lord. Again, we're excited for Jaden today. Jaden, a couple of weeks, I think it's been now, surrendered her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She's a born-again Christian. She's not ashamed. She came forward, and I respect her for that. She wanted to get baptized. I respect her for that because her walk with the Lord is vitally important right now, and we want to see her make it, don't we? This is your family. This is your sister in Christ. And she's taking that step of faith now in baptism. So I want to ask you, Jaden, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Did you ask him into your heart and life? Yes. Okay, you get ready. Upon the profession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord.
welcome everybody that's joined us today. Uh, good to have you here. Welcome to those that are on Facebook. It's kind of different today, but it's it's still nice. So we have Fred here with some brochures. So if you're new or visiting, whatever, lift your hand up and he can hand you a brochure that explains the church a little bit and what we believe in. Glad to have you. Um, there's a reminder to please silence your cell phones so we don't distract from other people. Um, if you have a prayer request, please fill out a card on the prayer box down in the foyer or submit the request to prayer at cfassembly.com. All the requests are prayed over each week. And during the week, people at home also pray in their prayer time. Uh, join us Sunday mornings at 9.30 down in the lodge or online Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. via Zoom. You can send a prayer request to info at cfassembly.com for a link. Uh, the men's ministry is starting a Bible study at the church on Wednesday evenings. And it's beginning August 16th at 6.30. I guess there's a sign-up sheet at the back table, so please fill that out if you're interested. And you can see Paul or Ken if you have any questions. You guys can raise your hands there. So just reach out to them. Uh, the ladies will be meeting for breakfast on Saturday, August yeah. 19th at 10. And Sandra is going to be speaking. <laughs> the ladies will be starting the Elijah Bible Study Series on Saturday, September 2nd. Anybody that's ordered and paid for the book please pick up the copy after the service from Bonnie or Diana. If you don't have a copy, they are available still for sale, and they're $17. So we're going to have offering now. If you just want to come up, bring the offering and drop them in the plates, and we'll go on. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for always providing for us. You meet our needs. And Father, God, out of obedience, we want to give back to you, Lord just a portion of what you have given to us. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.
Julia momentarily. Ginger. Yeah, Jin, you want to just bring the mic out there? A real quick, quick testimony. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody remembers, but my grandson came and stayed with me for about a month. He's just turned, um, he's going to be turning 17. But he just got his driver's license and was driving. He was back in Oklahoma with his parents but was driving and there was a 20 mile an hour curve and he went 55 miles an hour. Wow. Went right into the, um, I guess it would be the pastor of, you know, went through the bar barbed wire fence and stuff, came out of it completely unhurt. Wow. Which is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just praise God for that and um, just wanna just keep holding him up and hope that he learned something with that whole thing. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. That's awesome. Brother Terry, I think it's really awesome, a testimony of the Lord. I know you're sitting way back there, but that you're here. And for those of you who don't know, Brother Terry has been pretty sick lately where he hasn't been able to come to church. And I'd say just the fact that you're here, God is faithful. Amen. Amen. We have a healing God. Yes, we do. That's Amen. Right. The Lord let me have some episodes that made me so dizzy, it was amazing. Uh, and I'm not even a teenager, and I was still dizzy. <laughs> so the Lord helped me through that, and I haven't had an episode in a month, so I'm allowed praise to go out again. So praise the Lord, because we have a healing God. Who can praise say that God. with me? Yeah, we, we have, have a healing, healing God. God. Amen. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Pastor, we were just having a little testimony time here. Anybody else? I want to just thank the Lord for the healing touch on my body. Amen. He brought me yes. through a lot of things. And he's bringing me back again. Thank Amen. You. And for those of you who don't know Brother Larry, the doctors told him a number of times that he better get his everything in order because he's going to die. But God had different plans for you. Right, Larry? Amen. Praise the Lord. He's brought you through. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Just real quick, the kids are going to stay in service today. Uh, we're going to have communion later on. Later. The nursery is open. Later on is right now. Is this yours, Renee? Or what is that? Okay. Am I on this thing? Yes. What? I know. Gentlemen, you're preparing for a communion? As we prepare for communion, this is a very, very important thing. Jesus warns us not to take it unworthily. If you have habitual sin in your life, you might not want to be taking this. All right. Again, communion does not save us either. It does not save our souls. But Jesus asked us to remember, but it's important that we take it worthily because we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood 
the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, meaning they're dead. God takes it very seriously. And when we take communion, we're not to put our trust in ourselves or anything we do. We put our trust in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. That's the only thing we are to put our faith in. Nothing else. No religion, no denomination, no other person, nothing. We put it strictly in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So examine your hearts and say, Lord, if there's anything in me that's not right, I ask that the blood of my Lord and Savior cleanse me. If you have your bread, just hold it up. Symbol of the broken body of Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 24, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance me. Let's all break the bread, partake. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us upon the cross. Lord, by your stripes, you said that we are healed. We receive that divine healing also because of what you did. We remember you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's take the grape juice, a symbol of his shed blood. Verse 25, 26 says, After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it, again in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's all partake. Lord, we thank you for that shed blood upon Calvary's cross that you did for us. We should have been the ones there, but Lord, you took our place. You took our place. You gave your life. No man took it, you gave it. And we thank you, Lord, for dying for us upon that cross for our sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. And now, Lord, as we continue the service, Holy Spirit, you're here. We invite you here. We love you, Holy Spirit. We know Jesus is here where two or three are gathered in his name. He's here. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that your word be anointed today, that it be an encouragement to us, Lord, as we walk this journey through life and we surrender our time to you right now, Lord, because we desire to hear your word. You told us not to forsake our coming together, especially as we see the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we commit the balance of this service to you for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God.
Brother Rick, or Brother Brom, or whatever brother, could be a sister. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, again, welcome to Crossfire Assembly. Look at somebody and say, boy, am I glad I'm here. Are you really? Look at somebody again and say, I'm, I know I'm glad I'm here. But no, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I'm glad I'm here. Okay, I took it for all it's worth there, didn't I? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So anyway, this week I was pondering on what I should speak on today and knowing and seeing what's happening in the world and in your world. Blinded by discouragement. Anybody in here ever been discouraged? I bet we all have, haven't we, at one point in our life? Will again, should Jesus tarry? We're in a warfare. The one thing the enemy is trying to do, he's trying to tear the family apart. He's trying to tear a church apart. He'll do whatever he can. He will, uh, he will bring witchcraft within the church. Use people, even people with good intentions that will come in and help destroy a church within if we allow him to get a hold of us. And we don't do what the scriptures say. That will bring discouragement. The world is full of discouragement right now. You can look around every nation of the world, the fighting, the wars, everything happening, even within our nation, within our schools, within every part of government, and it can go on. But most importantly, right into your home. So I want to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, just touch on it a little bit today. I'm not going to go long, not past three hours. I want to see how many were listening and heard that. And praise the Lord. First, I want to say, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. I'm going to say that again. Holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Don't hold grudges. The only one that will harm is you and me. Let it go. One word. Let it go. <laughs> but there are times when discouragement can rob us of our courage and hope. Amen? It can rob us. Take the joy out of life. About 75 years ago, there was a woman named Florence Chadwick who was the first woman sw to swim the English Channel both ways. Then in 1952, she decided to swim from Catalina Island to the shore of California, a distance of about 22 miles. The day she chose to swim turned foggy and chilly as she began her swim. And she could hardly see the boats accompanying her. Still, she swum steadily for 15 hours and then begged to be taken out of the water. Her mother was in a boat alongside her and told her that she was close and that she could make it. Physically and emotionally exhausted, Florence just stopped swimming and was pulled out. It wasn't until she was aboard the boat that she discovered the shore was less than a half a mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen shore, I would have made it. She could have made it. She could have made it. It was only another half mile, but Florence Chadwick didn't give up because she was not strong enough to finish. She gave up because she became discouraged. She couldn't see the shore, so she lost her faith. Her discouragement blinded her. And today within the church, we have people who have been discouraged for whatever reason, they become discouraged and they leave the church. And we're in a race, as Paul says. We're running a great race. And many are giving up. Jesus said in the last days there would be many that would fall away. And there are many Christians giving up. 
before they get there because they're not looking forward. They're not seeing the hope, the glory ahead, what Christ has promised us, but they're giving up because of whatever, again, discouragement has come into their lives. And we need to be care, very careful of our souls, amen? So I want to touch on somebody within the Bible here that his name is Joseph. Remember him in the book of Genesis, Joseph? I like that guy. He had two boys, and the names he gave them would seem to indicate that he'd gotten discouraged at one point in his life. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. And that word toil could even be hardship, either one. Meaning all his worries, grievances, his trouble, his sorrow, his labor, his weariness, God has made me forget. Only God can do that, by the way. The second boy was Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of affliction. That is meaning bodily pain, mental distress, trouble, depression, and misery. Joseph named his two sons those two names. His toil and his affliction. What's that all about? What's it all about? What had happened to Joseph that would make him to name his kids the way they did? I mean, how would you like to name your little boy or girl affliction? Or hardship. Well, it goes back to his youth. He had 10 older half-brothers who basically hated him, and they hated him because their dad loved Joseph better than them. And even God seemed to like him better, too, when you read the story. That can hurt. I want to segue just for a moment on that for uh, today because we have Christians that have several issues going on in their lives within this church, within all churches. We have bitterness. We have envy. We have unforgiveness. We have hatred. We have name-calling, backbiting, families. Literally families. Not only the family of God that that's happening, but within the family. We have families destroying one another. Satan is having a heyday with families. He's having a heyday with them. And many Christians are falling into the traps and being used by Satan to build walls between their loved ones in order to tear them apart. Whole families will go through their whole life not talking to one another, running away from, because we're giving in instead of doing what God has told us to do according. I'm talking about born-again Christians that aren't reading their Bible and they don't know what God says to do and there's issues that come in between us or within our families and how to deal with them. Because when we do it God's way, Satan doesn't get a foothold. When we do it the devil's way, it tears families and people apart. And we need to remember that. That brings discouragement the joy's gone. The happiness is gone of life because there's so much of that going on within the family. We lose sight of what God wants us to do, and he's coming soon. He's, he's preparing a bride. But Satan is good at what he does. And we need to be discerning in our life to understand what's happening within the church and within our own personal families. If all of a sudden you get an attitude toward one another, check out where that attitude is coming from. Maybe it's pride in yourself. Maybe it's something going on that you that God wants to clean up in you or me. Amen? I know it's going to be quiet in here today. I got a lot of quiet sermons. <laughs> that way if people don't like noise, this is the place to be. I'll give a good sermon. But I'm serious. There's a lot of hurting people, a lot of discouraged people today, and they're getting their eyes off the sight, the target, the end of the race, and they're allowing an the enemy. They're fighting Satan in their own strength. 
not allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work within them to bring forgiveness, to put love where there's been hate. It's not easy. I understand it. Every family's got something going on in it that can be disturbing and make you angry or whatever and bring separation. We all fight against it. But as born-again believers, we ought to do it God's way and mend things if at all possible. And even if we feel and know we're right, we have the responsibility, according to the Word of God, to forgive and go to that person. Amen? Amen. It's truth. Some things that will make any difference in light of eternity. Just think. Think about what is making people angry and distancing themselves from their loved ones and their church. Think about the reasons they're doing it. They're ridiculous in light of eternity. In light of eternity, those are things that go, poof, they're gone. And they will pass away, but yet we destroy someone's life or our own because we want to make sure that we're treated exactly the way we should be treated. We're in a me society. It's all about me. It's all about me. I love me so much. Jesus said in last days we'll be lovers of self more than lovers of God. And we're watching it, people. We don't want it in the church. Do we? We want to be a family together. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ if you're in here this morning and you're born again. And if you have ought against me, don't hold a grudge. Get rid of it. You're going to die from it if you don't because I'm still doing okay. But you need to forgive. And I would rather have your prayers than your criticism. Amen? Amen. Because everybody in here, and I've said it repeatedly, I'm going to say it again because it's worth repeating. Everybody in here is created uniquely. There's nobody else like you. Your personalities are all different. And it's even like in a marriage, God will bring two people together that may be far apart in their personalities and everything, but through God's grace and mercy and the power of the Holy Spirit, day after day, he was chipping and grinding and sanding, and he's bringing those two together in love. And they're becoming like Jesus. That's what he does within the body of Christ, too. When we look at each other, we do not have to like each other's in here. We do not. Right, Brom? I don't have to like you, do I? See, Brom's waving at me. But I have to love you, don't I, Brom? No matter what. God has called me to... God says, if I don't love my brothers and sisters, I do not have the love of the Father in me. Amen. I don't have the love of the Father. That's why I'm working on it, as you need to be working on it too, that if somebody says something that isn't quite right or does something that isn't quite right, i got to learn to have a forgiving spirit and pray for that person. If we believe they've harmed you or hurt you in any way, you need to bow your head and say, God, give me strength to forgive them. Give me strength to get along with them. Lord, do a work in their life. Maybe the reason they latch out at me is because they're hurting inside and they're discouraged and they're blinded by it. Healing will come. And it's awesome when unity comes to the family. Look at today. I have family members. They're in a different, one is in a different religion. So he doesn't want anything to do with me. I love that brother of mine, and I pray for him every day. But look how Satan will divide a family and keep us separated for years, missing out on all the great things of life. And he does it in the church. That's what baffles me. I'm just being honest with you people as a pastor. I get baffled when I see and hear certain things that are frivolous. And they'll try to come in and divide a church. Or they'll leave a church for nothing. Sad, isn't it? Amen. How sensitive we can get in this hour we live. God gave Joseph two dreams that indicated that the older brothers would one day bow down and honor Joseph. 
And that didn't go over well with them. Did you know that? Pride. Pride's got a lot to do with a lot of our situations in our families. It's got a lot to do with it, just like Joseph, his brothers. Bow to him. Are you kidding that little runt? But that's what it, the dream was about. And we get jealous over one another because God will allow somebody to have, use their gifting within a church and we criticize them rather than saying, thank you, Lord, for bringing that brother or sister in here with that gift. Thank you for them. Don't allow the spirit of witchcraft to come in to your life. It will infiltrate your attitude and yourself and your family also out beyond these walls. And that's a form of rebellion. Do it God's way. Hallelujah. Amen. In fact, these brothers became so angry with Joseph that one day they got Joseph off by himself. They threw him into a pit and they planned to kill him. Their own brother. That's what anger and bitterness and unforgiveness can end up be today, even within a church, and we kill people spiritually. Because we don't do it God's way. Always bring yourself back to King Jesus. And while they were yet sinners, Christ died for them. He looked out and while they were hanging on the cross and his blood was flowing from his body and the wounds in his flesh torn off, he looked at you and I and he said, God, forgive them for they don't know what they do. That's what we do to each other, too. We got to learn to forgive. Frivolous things. Some things are serious. I don't take it all for granted. There are some horrible things that happen to people, and you need the grace of God and the mercy to get through it. But God says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He can bring healing where there's been depth of hurt. He can take a cold-blooded murderer and take his heart and make it mush where that man will bow his head to Jesus as he did on the cross, said, God, forgive me. And the anger that you and I carry in the bitterness, when we surrender to Jesus, he can wash it away in that precious blood that has power. Satan doesn't want us to do that. We're going to stand because it's only right. I got rights. And we know what happens. Sometimes it's good just to swallow and accept it and learn to be like Jesus. When he was railed against, he railed not back. He didn't say, I'm going to get even with them. They have no right saying that. I've never done a thing wrong in my life, and they have. He didn't do that. They cursed him. They rejected him. They hated him. And he looked at him with love and said, I forgive you. We get some work to do, don't we, people? Hallelujah. But then along came a caravan of slave traders, and they sold Joseph. But as a slave in Egypt, things went well for him. This is until the master's wife fell in love with him. Satan's always got somebody around to trip us up. Always. Don't ever think you arrived. Don't ever believe you arrived. Because it, the moment you do is when the enemy is going to trip you up. When he refused her advances, she accused him of attempting to rape her, and her husband believed her and threw Joseph in prison. There's poor Joseph again. He gets thrown in prison again. And he didn't do anything wrong. Did Joseph go around? I don't read it in there, but do you think he went around tearing the, pr the prison guard apart and Potiphar and his wife? Do you think he went around and did that? I don't. Could he have been discouraged? Probably. For about 17 years, Joseph was a captive in Egypt, first as a slave and then as a prisoner. 17 years, he was a young boy when he went in. But 17 years of his life was taken because of wrong things said and done to him. But yet I do not read in the scripture where he complained and murmured and tried to tear people apart. In all that time, he had no hope of seeing his family ever again. And that was toil. 
That was hardship. Some translations use the word hardship. King James uses the word toil pretty much the same. And, and that was affliction to him, to him personally. And that was why he named his son Manasseh, meaning making forget, and Ephraim, meaning double fruitful. Now, oddly enough, Joseph never seemed to have a pity party. I don't read about pity parties about him. When he was sold into slavery, he was the best slave he could be. When somebody's tearing you apart, be the best person you can to represent Christ in your life. Let somebody tear you down, rail you if you've done nothing wrong or whatever, but you don't have to get a pity party and you don't have to rail back. Let the Holy Spirit do a work in you and in that person. And then you won't be so quickly to get angry and bitter and unforgiving when we learn to do it Jesus' way. He was such a good slave that his masters put him in charge of everything. Can you believe that? The prisoner. <laughs> then, when he was in prison, he was the best prisoner he could be, and the warden of the prison made him a trustee. See what the Holy Ghost can do in us when we do it God's way? We can always latch out. We can always leave a church. We can always divorce a spouse. We can always tell the Kids, get out of here. But not Joseph. He became a trustee because he knew. He knew. And I'll tell you what he knew later. Almost one-third of the book of Genesis is focused on Joseph's life, but you never read of him being discouraged. He may have been, but you never read it. Except when we read about him naming his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Could be he was discouraged at that point. He didn't deserve to be treated like that. How could Joseph avoid being blinded by discouragement? Here's the answer I found in Genesis chapter 41, verses 41 and 52. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Notice what Joseph did in the midst of difficulties. I just read it to you. God has made me forget. God has made me forget. God caused me to be fruitful. He was looking to God, wasn't he? The Holy Spirit can help us forget things that we don't need to remember. And Joseph was so connected to God that that was his mindset all through his captivity. He was connected to God. We need to get connected to God. Yeah. As a congregation here, uh, let alone all the other congregations yeah. in the world. Yeah, that's right. The church needs to get back to unity yeah. and quit being so discouraged with things that happen. Little petty things are the big things that m become mountains from molehills when we let them but when discouragement sets in, be careful. For example, in Genesis 39, when we read the story of Joseph's slavery and imprisonment, and in that chapter, here's the words, chapter 39, 2 and 3. This is key right here. And the Lord was with Joseph. Is the Lord with you? If he is... And he was a prosperous man and was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He was prosperous even being a slave. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. See, when you do it God's way, you can prosper in the middle of affliction. In the middle of your discouragement, in the middle of your affliction, when you do it God's way, you will prosper. Why? Because even the world will look at you and say, the Lord is with them. Hallelujah. Say with me, the Lord was with him. Hallelujah. Then later, when Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph of attempted rape, Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. Threw him into prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. He threw him into prison, but God was in the prison with him. 
Hallelujah. Are you in, in your prison in your home today? Are you in prison in your mind today? If you invite Jesus in, he will be with you in the middle of it, and he will reign healing upon you emotionally and mentally and physically. He will begin to do a new work in you, and people will look to say the Lord is with them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Genesis 39, 20, 21, And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. Whew. Verse 21, hold on to your seats, okay? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. God will give you favor in your home. God will give you favor in your business. God will give you favor in your church. God will give you favor wherever you go when you do it God's way. Discouragement has no place when God is with you. It's easy to get discouraged today, but we need to be like Joseph. We need to have a heart for God. Be connected to God that when the hard times come, when the toil come, the afflictions come, we instantly were in communication with our God because he's with us. That's why it's important to be born again because Christ comes and lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And that's who's there where we can communicate with. Genesis 39, 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. That's interesting. When you read these scriptures, notice four times in chapter 39 alone, we're told the Lord is with him. Four times. Four times. Now the phrase does show up once in the story about Samuel, David, Hezekiah, and a couple others. But Genesis 39 is the only chapter where that phrase shows up four times. God is with him. Why does it show up so often with Joseph's story? Well, it shows up so often because Joseph knew God was with him. Would we treat our family members any differently if we literally would focus in our hearts and minds knowing God's with me? Would we retaliate back to tear them apart because they hurt us and we're discouraged in our life because of things, relations are going bad, situations are going bad? Or would we, like Joseph, remind ourselves, God's with me no matter what happens. I'm going to make it. I'm more than a conqueror to th through Christ. I'm a victor. Because he's with me, no matter what somebody is spewing out about me, no matter what they're doing to me, whatever it is, God, you're with me. You'll take care of it all. Whatever they take from me, you're going to return it to me in a greater way. Amen. we got to quit holding on to things in this world so tight that God can't do a work in us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that was the secret that kept Joseph from being blinded by discouragement. Joseph knew that God was with them. Now, everybody gets discouraged every once in a while, and some people get discouraged a lot more than others. But there's a couple things I'd like to consider quickly about in discouragement this morning. The first is this. When you spell the word discourage, when you spell the word discouraged, do you see something embedded in that word, discouraged? There you go. Got some good spellers in here. We see the word courage, don't we? Now, discourage has a sister word called encourage. Encourage. Notice courage is part of that word too. The only difference between those two words is the first or two or three letters, whatever. They're called prefixes and they modify the main word. The dis prefix means to take away from, to remove. When you're discouraged, Satan is taken away. He's removing something from you, making you discouraged. He's working in your life, and you've got to discern and understand what's happening. Why is the discouragement coming against me today? And deal with it. Amen? Amen. Thus, discourage means something is taken away or removed your courage from you. The N prefix means in or put in. Woo. Hallelujah. Yes. I like to have things put in for me, huh? Amen. 
I tell you what, the encourage means something is put in, put courage into you. Today, Lord, I need courage. I need courage to walk in my home today. My children are rebellious. My spouse, either one, are not where they belong with you, Lord. I'm dealing with temptations. I'm dealing with financial problems. I'm dealing with health problems. Lord, I need some encouragement today. I need that put in. I need something put in. Know you're with God. Watch what the Holy Spirit will do with you when you're connected to him and not your discouragement. So looking at the word discouraged first, what could take away or remove our courage? Well, a lack of courage can come when we face situations we can't control, right? We feel helpless, vulnerable, and weak. Nothing we can do. We're faced with dangers we can't understand or deal with. That's what happened to Joseph, all those things. All of them. He found himself in a foreign land with no chance of getting home. He was a slave and he was trapped in his slavery. He couldn't change the fact that he was not in his own man. And when he was a prisoner, he was locked behind doors and he had never been able to open them because he was an area he could not control. So you can understand why he would get discouraged. Now, none of you are physically in slavery. Amen? Praise the Lord. In a foreign land. And none of you are prisoners in a physical jail today. But you might be slaves to circumstances that you can't control right now. You can't control another person. You can't control what other people do. You can't control what people say to you. It's out of your control. You might be imprisoned in situations you can't overcome. Sometimes people want to blame other people for it. They want to try to get other people to manipulate other people to do whatever, to try to get control, to get out of things. But none of that stuff works. It could be a health issue, including mental or emotional health, or a relationship that's falling apart, being falsely accused, gossiped about, backbiting, or a job that makes you feel miserable. It could be financial problems, and the list could go on and on and on with those. For young people, many times, they want to be liked. And they'll do things they shouldn't do to get people to like them, and they don't need to do that. But it seems out of control. It's situations like that that can rob you of courage and hope, and that can blind you with discouragement. So what can you do about that? How do you get courage back when you're in deep discouragement? Well, the only way to get back that discouragement that you've lost is to, or the courage you've lost is to find your courage somewhere else. Amen? You find it somewhere else. But where? Where are you going to get this encouragement from? Where are you going to get courage that can be put into you? How many need some encouragement put into you today? Huh? The same place Joseph did. From God. Oh, that's simple, Pastor. No, that's the answer, people. He's the only one that can give you the help. Whether you mock me for it or not, God is the answer to every one of our problems. Every one of them. The same place. Luke 137 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing! Luke 18, 27, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. Take it to God. If somebody wants to take everything from you, let them have it. God will get it back for you some way, somehow, holy and righteous way. But he'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. Joseph looked to God for his strength. God made me forget God made me fruitful. God was with me through all my difficulties. You see where Joseph got the victory? Discouragement turned into encouragement because he was connected with God himself. And so easy, people, we forget God quickly. Some of us will walk out that door and something will hit us and pretty soon we're back in the old norm. Instead of saying, no, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm going to fight this fight. 
I'm going to put on my armor. Amen. I'm going to put on that helmet of salvation that the enemy would try to... We want to be keepers of the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? That's where discouragement tries to come through here. Got your helmet of salvation on today? Huh? You got your breastplate of righteousness? Whose righteousness is it? It's Christ Jesus. So you walk around with Christ's righteousness and all the fiery darts that are shot at you or trying to bring you down will bounce off because of Christ's righteousness in you. The belt of truth. You have the word of God to give you the truth how to deal with every problem. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Everything we have. And then prayer. The most hindered thing in a Christian's life. Prayer. Prayer. I've been in a lot of prayer meetings in my life. And I'm amazed how many will not be involved in prayer. The very thing that enforces the armor. Prayer. So the only one who can take care of every single problem in this room right now with all of us. He's the only one that can do it. But yet we will not pray. I'm sorry, folks. No, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. Prayer is vitally important in our lives. And it's the one main thing that finishes off the armor is communicating with our Heavenly Father. Don't look around other people. Don't try to put something on other people. It, it doesn't work. You can't control anyone else, and neither can I. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's something that you have to be connected with God and let God unravel the impossibilities of your life. Only he can do it. Have you ever heard the phrase, God will never leave you nor forsake you? You ever hear that? That's in the book of Hebrews. But Hebrews is actually quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 31.8, where Moses told Joshua, And the Lord he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. Neither be dismayed. It doesn't say please don't. It said neither be dismayed. That means being disheartened and deprived of courage. We have courage in us through the Holy Spirit. We walk in courage. When discouragement comes along, you tell discouragement, go in the name of Jesus. I walk in courage today. I don't care what's coming against me. God is in control of my life. I cast all my care upon him, not somebody else, not money, not anything. You cast them upon the Lord. And when you do that, he said, I care for you. And you want to see the power of God begin to move you in several different ways? Woo-wee! Lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. The dead shall be raised. Hallelujah. The captives will be set free. Why? Because like Joseph, you're connected to God. God said the same thing to Joshua after Moses died in Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee? Have, say that. Have I not commanded thee? Say it again. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee with, whithersoever thou goest. Yes. Amen. That's from our Lord. See, when we take that to heart, it becomes real to us, and we get victory, and we walk in encouragement. You may walk around with your chin so low, you could eat oatmeal out of a stovepipe. <laughs> but when you focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that chin will come back up, and courage will come back within you, and discouragement will have no place in you. That's the truth, people. This isn't a fairy tale. This is truth. God was telling Joshua, don't lose your courage. Don't fall into depression feel, or feel dejected. Don't yield yourself to fear or terror. Right. I can't explain that. I can't explain it other than I know that it works. I know that it works. I just know it works. And it's repetitive throughout the whole Bible. When you read the whole scripture, you'll find that theme. It works. 
In fact, it shows up in one of my favorite passages, Philippians 4, 4, 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I like Brother Paul. He was always full of joy, rejoicing and praising God, even in the middle of his trials and his discouragement, which had to go because he walked in joy. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful. Be careful for nothing but in everything by Boy, that was weak. <laughs> but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God like Joseph did. I added, but Joseph did. That's what we need to do. If you do that, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. If you do that... God's promise and the peace of God. How many need the peace of God today? I need the peace of God. The understanding. It passes understanding. Why do you... I've heard testimonies in my family. I'm sure you got them too. There's times when you've had some severe difficulties in your life, but you were under total peace and calm. Do you understand why? When my wife's brother died, he was a close brother to her. He's like a father to her. She, when he died, I thought she'd fall apart, but she said to me, she said, I don't know, we were brand new Christians. She said, I don't know, but she said, I have such a peace in me right now. She didn't understand it. It was beyond her, but she couldn't figure it out. She knew why, because we led him to the Lord just shortly before he died. And it was a confirmation from God that that's, he was now with him. God will bring peace in the middle of your trials. When you do that, when you pray. No, I don't want to be like the big guy. Pray! God wants us to pray. Hallelujah. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12.10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God brought courage into Paul's life continually. Think of the things that man went through that most of us couldn't handle, but Paul did because he was connected like Joseph to God, and God brought him through every circumstance, and he finished the good fight of faith. I can't explain it, but it works, people. It truly works. Paul, I'm sure, did not like the infirmities. He didn't like the reproaches, the necessities, the persecution, the distress. But each time he was experiencing, he, like Joseph, he knew God was going to bring these things to pass for his good and God's glory. Whatever's going on in our life, they will pass away and it'll be for our good and for God's glory. We need to hang on to that. Someone said, if you are ever to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might, your strength will be born in a storm. That's a good word. That's where God does most of his work in our storms. How we're going to handle them. What's going to happen within our life. The thing is to realize that you and I are weak, but God isn't. Amen. God's not weak. How can you say God's... I, I, I get a kick out of people, uh, I'm a believer, and they say, yeah, your God's a weak guy. I said, no, he's not. He holds the waters of the world in the palms of his hands. He touches the moon, the stars, and everything in the universe with his hand and keeps them in place right where he wants them by the word of his mouth. My God's weak. Yours is non-existent. The first part of 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Is your heart perfect toward God? God's looking for you. He knows how to find you. He's looking for hearts. He knows hearts. He knows email. Hallelujah. As God told the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. People will look at you in the middle of a storm that you're going through and see you become victorious and courageous, and they'll wonder why. And you can share the gospel with them. 
Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's when we learn to trust that God will never leave us nor forsake us that we regain our courage. He will turn our discouragement into encouragement, whether it's your physical health or anything else in your life. He'll turn it around if you trust him. Hallelujah. Psalms 24, 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He's battling on our behalf. He's a warrior, the lion of the king of Judah. He's the commander in chief, the true one. And he's at work in your and my life every day. And we should not be discouraged. He will put back in you the courage that you need when you look to him. People who have become discouraged have Satan has taken away their trust and faith in a never failing heavenly father. And they put it in the money, man and sex and drugs, booze and everything else. When is all we got to look up and say, Jesus. And he's battling for us. Hallelujah. So in conclusion, I'll stop there. But I want to read you this quick story here. There was a story of a single woman named Gladys Eilard. I Lord, who became a missionary to China. She loved the Chinese people. But World War II was beginning and she was forced to flee the invading Japanese army. She was torn by the belief that she couldn't just leave the people she loved to suffer, especially the many orphans there. So with only one assistant to help her, she led more than 100 children over the mountain to reach freedom. Over 100 children, she led them. During that long and hard journey, she began to struggle with despair and discouragement. There was no way they'd ever reach safety. The children would starve and die in the way, and she couldn't stop it from happening. She had no power to do it. It became obvious to the children that their leader was losing hope and not sleeping so. One morning, a 14-year-old girl in the group reminded her about their much-loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. See how important it is to give the gospel to young people? The Israelites survived, and so would they. The missionary bitterly cried out, but I'm not Moses! And the girl replied, of course you aren't, but Jehovah is still God. I like that response. But this is the rest of the story. At last they came to a river they couldn't cross, and four days they were trapped there. At one point, a young child asked, why does God not open the waters of the Yellow River for us to cross as he did for the Israelites? For a moment, she paused. She thought, I cannot open these vast waters. I have no power other than the power of my own faith. But then she told the children, let's all sing a hymn to God and perhaps soon our prayers will be answered. And believe it or not, not far away, an army of Chinese soldiers heard the children singing. And when the soldiers came to where the children were, they supplied food for the children and boats to cross the river. And Gladys' children made their way to safety. God answered the prayer. Do you have a hymn we can sing? Are we going to sing a hymn? I don't have a hymn, but I have a song. Let's do a song. When the my senses when my blindness keeps me from your touch. Jesus, come let's all stand, please. When my burdens keeps me doubting, when my memories take the place of.
Hallelujah. Glory to God. This morning, quickly, I want to ask again, if you walked in here this morning, you've never, ever received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the most important part of a sermon service is this part right now. Because we are going to all die one day should Jesus tarry. That's why he died on the cross, so that we would have an opportunity that should something happen to her, he comes back. We are prepared. Our souls, our spirits are prepared to be with him. And he made an invitation to you and I. This morning, I want to make that invitation to you. Jesus said, whomsoever will, come on to me, and I will in the wise cast out. And if you're here this morning and you've never done that, say, Pastor, I don't know if I died or Jesus come. I don't know. I, I'm hoping I go to heaven. You're going to miss heaven. You, can't, you don't get to heaven on your hope. You got to know, the Bible says you can know that you are saved if you do what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, not one human being is. And our righteousness is a stench in his nostril. And if you need salvation, I would like to invite you to just step out and come and stand toward and look at me. That takes, takes a little bit of Huh? Courage, not discourage, but courage. And if you know you need it, this might be your last invitation. And I warn people, every time you hear it and you come to a service and you don't do anything with it, when you know the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, your heart will grow cold and you will no longer respond ever. It's a danger. Jesus, beware lest your heart become hardened. Is there anyone? Just come forward. Just like our young sister did a couple of weeks, just come forward. Hallelujah. Is there anybody? Anyone in here? Just got to make sure. Let me ask how many in here just say, Pastor, I've walked through times of discouragement. And I'm discouraged this morning in certain things going on in my life. Just raise up your hand. Don't worry about anybody around you. Who cares? Only care about Jesus, what he thinks. I'm going to ask everybody, and we're going to circle around the front here that have that, and I want to pray with you right now that you throughout this day are going to find courage coming into your life. Come on, just do it. Just move out and come up here and listen around here. If you've got discouragement, you come up here right now. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to rid you of that discouragement. Come on, young, old, whomever. Come on, don't hold back. The Holy Ghost knows. Don't tell the Holy Ghost one thing and do another. If you're discouraged, come on up here. Just move in real close there, young lady. So we got room. Come on, there's more people. Come on. Discouragement is something happening in our world today. And we don't want to walk in discouragement. We don't need to. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Discouragement. Discouragement is hitting homes like crazy. You don't know when you walk out, you may be discouraged once you walk out these doors. Prepare your hearts. Hallelujah. We're going to pray right now. You that are sitting there, you're encouraged in your hearts. Praise the Lord. If you're not, you should be up here. Not that being up here is going to do the work, 
or even my prayer. It's your faith in the one who is able to put into you the Holy Spirit power that would make you, give you courage to walk out of your discouragement. Heavenly Father, say with me, Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I'm discouraged this morning. And I want to be delivered from all discouragement in my life. And Lord, I know it'll come back again somewhere. But every time it does, I'm running to you for you to put into me courage. And so, Lord, we come to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ask you right now, fill us with your joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy is here this morning. I receive it by faith. I rebuke discouragement. I command it to leave my mind and to forget the things that are bringing discouragement. Lord, let me walk in the joy of the Lord this morning throughout this day. I receive it by faith. It comes from you as you said yourself. Lord, hanging on the cross, you said for the joy of it, you got rid of the discouragement and you, law, you saw the future. You saw that, Lord, it was going to come to pass. And I pray for every one of these people up here right now that have come forward with discouragement up on their hearts. Lord, I pray you put within their hearts that you will deliver them from all their trials. Your word promise, not mine. You said, Lord, I will deliver them from all their trials and their troubles. This too shall pass away. I pray that you put that in their hearts deep, Lord. Let them walk out today knowing that your delivering power is coming into their lives, whatever it may be. You will bring deliverance. You will bring peace that passes understanding. You will bring your joy. You will bring that, that calmness within their spirits. And Lord, you will show up in the middle of their the discouragement and take away the dis and put the end in there and encourage them, Father. Their strength will return. Their joy will return. Their positive attitude on life will come back for rejoice for this is the day that the Lord hath made and be glad in it. I pray that for every person up here right now in Jesus' name. I want you people up here right now, just by faith, begin to praise him. Put your hands in the air and start rejoicing in the things of God. T tell the enemy to get lost. Tell that demon of discouragement to be gone in the name of Jesus. Demon discouragement, be gone in the name of Jesus. Be gone in the name of Jesus. You have no hold on me. Be gone, Satan. Be gone. We command you to leave. We walk in encouragement today because our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer lives. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. You are the God of the impossible. Lord, you will deal with the situations I'm dealing with, and you will turn them into joy. You will turn them into peace and understanding that, Lord, I won't even understand, but you can do it. Lord, touch every person here this morning. Lord, we worship you. Let the Holy Ghost move through you right now. If you speak in tongues, speak in tongues. Come on, people. It takes war. It takes war. Jesus called us warriors, soldiers of the cross. He said there would be many trials and tribulations, but my God will deliver me from all of them. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it takes war. It takes standing steadfast in your faith. You got to do your part. God has already done his part. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Oh, now, Lord, I just pray, Father, 
for everyone within this building, that you will continue to work and to move within our hearts and lives. Lord, as we enter dark times of this world, you said they would get darker. I'm being honest with the people. Preachers that tell you that there's good times coming, they're lying. Jesus said the world would become darker and darker. But we're not to fear. Jesus said, look up and rejoice, for your redemption draws nigh. And as dark times come and the world looks scary and freaky, we can turn to you, Lord, and be encouraged in our spirits, in our life, for we have a future and a hope. And Lord, you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. You would be with us to the very end. And Lord, I pray you touch every household, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, every area, Lord, let us walk as Joseph did. And the Lord was with him. Hallelujah. We thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for that, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Look at somebody and say, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. Now say it like you mean it. I'm Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Lord bless you. Have a great day. Hallelujah. This sure be, this is better than getting mad, isn't it? Huh? It is. Amen. Hallelujah.